Hello? I think it's live. Well, good morning, everyone. It's time to get started. And uh, I'm going to read from... Uh, You know, this is kind of like MASH. When the boss stands up, nobody listens, but somebody else says shush and everybody quiets down. How, how does that work? I have no idea. This is what Philippians 3 says, but whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. Paul had been a wealthy man a very prominent Pharisee, and he's lost everything, and he doesn't care. I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings becoming like him in his death, so somehow to attain to the resurrection of the dead. We're still going to talk about the resurrection this morning, even though it's post-Easter. Every Sunday is resurrection day. Amen? Yeah. That's why we worship on this day. That's why we don't worship on Saturdays, because this is resurrection day. It's why we worship on Sundays. If people want to worship on Saturday, I don't care. They can worship whatever day of the week they want. They can worship on Tuesday for all I care. But we worship on Sunday. Let's pray. Father, thank you that we can come into your house on this wonderful Sunday morning and worship you and give you the praise and the glory that is due your name. Lord, this time, as we say, I probably say every week, it's all about you. And we want to give you the praise and the glory that is due your name. And Lord, we share Paul's thinking. Lord, we'll give up everything for the sake of knowing Christ. The stuff doesn't matter. Money doesn't matter. Yeah, we need enough to, make the, to make, pay the bills and keep a roof over our head. But other than that, it doesn't really matter. It's just stuff. And it's all going to burn up someday anyway. But we want to know Christ and the power of your resurrection. So that one day too, Lord, we will be resurrected. And we thank you for that so very much. That's what Easter is all about. And that's what every Sunday is all about. We thank you, Lord, that we can be in your house on this day. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing with Doug and the team this morning. What a wonderful, wonderful day, day I will never forget. After I've wandered in darkness away, Jesus my Savior I met. Oh, what a tender, compassionate friend, he met the need of my heart. Shadows dispelling the joy I'm telling, he made all the darkness depart. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole. My sins were washed away and my night was turned to day. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Born of the Spirit in life of above, into God's family divine. Justified fully from Calvary above, oh, what a thing is mine. And the transition so quickly was made, when as a sinner I came. Took up the offer of proffer, praise his dear name. 
Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole, my sins are washed away and my night was turned to day. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Now I have a hope that will surely endure after the passing of time. I have a future in heaven for sure, there in the mansion sublime. And it's because of that wonderful day when at the cross I believe. Rich is eternal and blessing supernal from his precious land received. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole, my sins were washed away and my night was turned to day. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. You may all have a seat, please. Okay. We're going to do a new song today to some of you. Some of you may know it. It's a wonderful, simple song, and uh, I want to read from Ecclesiastes 5, verse 1 and 2, as this is how the author wrote this song. Guard your steps when you go to the house of God. Go near to listen rather than to offer the sacrifice of fools who do not know that they do wrong. Do not be quick with your mouth. Do not be hasty in your heart to utter anything before God. God is in heaven and you are on earth, so let your words be few. You are God in heaven, and here am I on earth. So I'll let my words be few. Jesus, I am so in love with you. I'll stand in awe of you, Jesus. Yes, I'll stand in awe of you. And I'll let my words be few. Yes, Jesus, I am so in love with you. The simplest of all love songs. Simplest of all love songs I long to bring to you. So I'll let my words be few. Jesus, I am so in love with you, and I'll stand in awe of you, Jesus, yes, I'll stand in awe of you. I'll let my words be few. Yes, Jesus, I am so in love with you. And I'll let my words be few. And I'll let my words be few. 
Yes, Jesus, I am so in love with you. Amen. Amen. You can be seated, and we'll turn the lights back on. Maybe. I think we will. Let's get Richard toward you. No, let's get these on. Over here. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, just a couple things to run by you real quick. This Saturday, I need help, men and women. We're doing an oil change, our semi-annual oil change for the moms, for single moms. If you're a single mom and you need the oil in your car changed, you come here next Saturday between 9 and 12.30. 9.30 and 12.30, not 9. We're not going to be ready at 9 o'clock. We'll be ready at 9.30. But I need help. I need guys and I need women inside to greet and chat with the single moms that come in. We need to be friendly. Everybody got that? Okay. Okay, just like Shannon, just like Shannon, yeah. Just, everybody be just like Shannon and we'll just change the world. Oh, help us, Hannah. Oh, please. Oh, good grief. Hey, you need to be here tomorrow night at 7 o'clock. The Blackwood Legacy Quartet is going to be here. And if you like good old Southern gospel music, folks, you need to come. We need a great crowd here tomorrow night. I, we've let every other church in town know, so I think this place is going to be really crowded. And we don't get a treat like the Blackwood Legacy Quartet very often. And they're gonna, we're going to take a free will offering. There's no tickets. I could, I could print tickets. No, I couldn't. No, I couldn't do that. But we're going to take a free will offering, so please come prepared to give generously. Okay, because they're coming. They have no idea what, how, what kind of money they're going to get. Whatever we give them in a love offering. So we need to give generously. We, we, we need to help them out. So tomorrow night, it starts at 7 o'clock. You're going to want to be here early. If you show up at 5 till, you may not get a seat. So you need to be here by like 5.30. <laughs> okay, not that early. Or 20 till 7 or whatever. Just show up whenever you want. But if you come at 2 minutes to 7, you may not get a seat. Okay, we're going to have a concert of prayer. Not tonight, but next Sunday night. Okay. I originally scheduled it for tonight. No, we're not going to do Sunday night, Monday night, and board meeting Tuesday night. Not three nights in a row. That's too much. We'll do a concert of prayer next Sunday night. Okay. And I did not put out a sign-up sheet for the single mom's oil change, so I am counting on people to show up to help. Even if you can't go underneath a car, guys, I still need help. Okay driving the cars up on ramps, handing people oil filters, running up to Nampa to get a filter because we don't have their size. I just need lots of help, so I'm counting on you guys to show up or we're going to die. I'm not counting on dying. Okay, ladies, Bible study starts April 15th. There's still study notes back there on the back table. If you want to get those on your way out, be sure and pick those up. They're, they're right there on the back table, and Lorene has prepared these so you know what's coming up. Okay, I think I've covered most of the announcements. I think. Yeah, bring, bring uh, guys, if, if bring some tools, okay? Bring like filter wrenches and like sockets to take off the oil plug underneath the car. We do have some tools here, but it'd be handy if you have your own, and we'll make sure you get to take them home. Okay, we'll make sure that Richard doesn't steal them. Okay, so that's that. Okay, Jim, it's all yours. Good morning. Good morning. Beautiful day out there, isn't it? Yes, it is. I just hope it lasts for a couple of weeks, but we need the rain too, don't we? So. We need it. Um, but we're Oregonians, right? We're used to the rain, so that's okay. Let it rain. Let it rain. Would the ushers come forward, please? Yeah. 
certainly glad to see uh, Ray and Marilyn back from Florida today. And uh, yes, yes, glad to have you back. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning on this beautiful Sunday morning, a uh, day in which we come to worship you. Uh, this is just one of seven days that we worship you, Lord, not just today. We just uh, thank you for the many blessings that you give us. And today, Lord, as we take up an offering for you, we just pray that you would bless it and uh, be with us and guide us throughout this week. We ask this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. So upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. The death into life everlasting he passed and we follow him there for us since no hath the indignion for more there than conquerors we are turn your eyes upon Look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. His word shall not fail you, he promised. Believe him and all will be well. Then go to a world that is dying 
His perfect salvation to tell. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in His wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim. In the light of His glory and grace. Thank you, Pete. You know what? They make playing those instruments look so easy, don't they? Ben could play that bass in his sleep. Does he play it in his sleep, Diana? Okay. Well, he could if he wanted to. We're going to go to prayer in just a minute, but before we do, I want you to watch a two-minute video. It's two minutes and two seconds. One of the people I probably have more respect for in this country than almost anybody is Reverend Dr. Billy Graham. Billy Graham is now in his home in Montreat, North Carolina. He is 96 years old. 96. He doesn't get out much anymore. He established years and years and years and years ago in Minneapolis the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, and his son Franklin is now the chair of the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. Billy Graham, obviously, at 96 years old, is not able to do that anymore. His son Franklin has taken over. Franklin Graham is not afraid to speak his mind. You know what, folks? Christians don't fight the same way the people in the world do. Amen? Our weapons are not the weapons of this world. But there's nothing wrong with Christians making their voice heard in America. We had better, or we're going to lose our country, folks. We're losing our country, and we're losing it fast. And I admire Franklin Graham because he is not afraid. He is not intimidated and not afraid to make his voice known. Now, we don't get into politics too much in this church. I stay out of politics. That's really you know, none of my concern. Okay? But he does get a little bit political here. But... This is pretty good. Go ahead and roll it, Cal. Let's turn some After off. the beheading light of off. those Christians in Egypt, you said, we better take this warning seriously as these acts turn of the, terror will you. only spread. The storm is coming. What, what storm do you see coming? Yes. The storm of Islam. And uh, what you're seeing, uh, Gordon, is this isn't just radical Islam. This is Islam. And they've been persecuting Christians, uh, minorities, for centuries. And we're going to see persecution, I believe, in this country because our president is very sympathetic to Islam. And the reason I say that, Gordon, is because he, his father was a Muslim, gave him a Muslim name, uh, Barack Hussein Obama. Uh, his uh, mother married another Muslim man. They moved to Indonesia. He went to Indonesian schools. So growing up, his, his frame of reference and his influences as a young man was Islam. It wasn't Christianity, Islam. And so uh, there are they're, they're Muslims that have access to him in the White House. Our, our foreign policy is, has a lot of influence now from Muslims. Uh, we, we see the, uh, the Prime Minister of Israel being snubbed by the President and by the White House and by the Democrats. Uh, and it's because of the influence of, of Islam. Uh, they hate Israel and they hate Christians. And so the storm is coming, I believe, Gordon. After 9-11, the Bush administration began to allow Muslims to come into various uh, uh, governmental agencies to advise us how uh, to respond to Muslims and how to respond to Islam after 9-11. And what's happened is you now have radical uh, Islamists uh, that are advising various levels of, of, of government. And it's, it's, going to, it's going to get worse. And, and nobody is, seems to be alarmed about it. Nobody is saying anything about this. And we as Christians are going to lose. Okay, that didn't quite end the way I thought it was going to, but 
You know what? Yeah, go ahead and turn a couple lights back on. You know what? Franklin Graham is exactly right. Radical Muslims are now advising the President of the United States about policy in America. Now, I know as a pastor in a church, I'm not supposed to get into politics. You know what? I don't care. This is wrong. This is just flat out wrong. The president is more critical of Christians and more favorable to Islam than any president I've ever seen in my lifetime. And it's a little bit scary to me, folks. And if you want to make a difference, call your congressman or call Ron Wyden or Jeff Merkley, our senators, and say, listen, we've had it with this. This is ridiculous. Radical, terrorist favoring Muslims are advising the highest levels of political power in the United States. And I don't speak out on stuff like this in church very often, because I know it gets into dicey ground when you get into politics, and you're not supposed to do that in church. But folks, this is wrong. This is just flat out wrong. This country was founded on Christian principles, not the principles of Islam. And Islam had been killing Christians since Muhammad went on rampages way before the Crusades ever started and way worse than the Crusades ever were. Do I hate Islam? Yes. Do I hate Muslim people? No. No. We love people. Amen? We need to pray for their souls. These suicide bombers are blowing themselves up and killing all kinds of Christians and thinking they're going to get 72 virgins when they get to heaven. Guess what? It's really sad. They're going to go to hell. And they don't know it. They think they're going to get this wonderful heaven, but they're not. And that saddens me. I don't want anybody to go to hell. I don't care what religion they are. I don't care if they're Buddhist, Hindu, Islam, I don't care what they are. I don't want anybody to go to hell. Christians, we want everyone to be saved. We need to pray for revival and a spiritual awakening among Islam across northern Africa and in the Mideast. That's what we need to pray for, and that's what we're going to pray for. So if you're able to, let's stand with me for prayer if you would. Let's stand in the presence of the Lord this morning. And we need to pray for spiritual awakening across our own country, for one thing, and throughout the world as well. We have much to be thankful for today. We have each other. We have the body of Christ here in Florence. And that's a powerful thing and, and a wonderful thing. Let's pray. Father, thank you. I just thank you for these people that are here standing in front of me. These wonderful people in this body of Christ. They're just such a foundational part of my life. Uh, they're just so important to me, these people are. And I just love every one of them. And I thank you that together we are a part of the body of Christ here in Florence. Lord, we want to make a difference. We want to make a difference in Florence. And um, we want to make a difference. We want Christians to make a difference everywhere in the world. Lord, I don't like the Islamic faith. It's, it's a tool of Satan. But we pray for Muslim people. We pray for spiritual awakening in countries like Iran and Iraq and Syria and Lebanon and Nigeria, throughout northern Africa, Saudi Arabia, where Christian churches aren't even allowed. They don't even allow Christian churches in Saudi Arabia. It's, Ill, it's against the law. I think there are a few Christians in Saudi Arabia, but they can't meet openly in a church building. It, it's illegal. We pray 
for a miracle of spiritual awakening and that these people would wake up and see that Muhammad is not the answer. And whatever God they're serving is the wrong one. That Jesus is the only answer. Franklin Graham has made it very clear in other videos I've watched that he loves Muslim people and he wants to see them come to Christ. And so does his dad and so do we. We want to see that happen. We pray for a miracle. We pray that Satan would be defeated. Here in the United States, here in Florence, in Oregon, throughout our country, throughout the world, we pray that, that Satan would lose and that tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people would come to Christ, oh God. We, we just pray for a miracle in that way, oh God. We pray for Tim Crump at, at uh, uh, Salem First Church, Lord, and pray that you would just do a great work there and you'd work in that pastor and do a wonderful thing there, oh God. Be with our district superintendent today, Dr. Reeder, and, and his assistant, Bud Pugh, wherever they might be at. I think that Dr. Reeder is at in Independence Monmouth at a new church plant there today and they're doing, celebrating a new building and I just pray that they'd You'd work through Andy there, their pastor, and that they'd just have an incredible, wonderful time, oh God. Just a, an, an awesome time, I pray. Lord, we pray for Marsha Brumley today. I'm not sure what's going on there. I know that she's having some gallbladder issues, and they were working over an antelope, and she's had to be taken to a hospital in Bend. And I don't know if she's had surgery yet or not. I don't know what's going on. But I pray for a complete healing in her body that you would just bring her back and that you would work through doctors and nurses and medical people to bring healing to her and help Leonard it's, I'm sure it's really tough for him to see his wife go through this and there were some complications yesterday Lord I don't know all about all those but I know there were some that were delaying the surgery and I pray they'd overcome those so that she, they can get this problem taken care of and that she can recover completely, oh God. Lord, I know there's other people here that are dealing with issues of one kind or another. They're, they're just all, every, I, probably, Lord, I'm guessing almost everybody that walked in the door today has some kind of issue going on in their life of one kind or another. It's, it's always, it might be minor, or it might be major. But whatever it is, Lord, we're just going to turn our hands down and lay it at your feet today. We're going to lay it at your feet. And we're going to ask you to take care of whatever it is that's going on. I know we're missing some people today. I'm not going to try to name all of them. But there's some people that aren't here because of physical reasons. And we just pray that you do a work of healing in them and help them in every way they need and there are people here today they're dealing with physical issues and relational issues and probably somebody here is probably dealing with a financial issue or something the, the, the challenges we face Lord the list is long but we're just going to turn them all over to you Lord we consider it all loss that we would gain Christ and, and the resurrection that comes with knowing Jesus we just give it all to you, O oh God. We just turn it all over to you. And, and we just consider the stuff of this world, Lord. I, I want to have the attitude that Paul did. Uh, yeah, I like having a car, and, and my wife likes having a car, and I like having a house. But the stuff of this world, Lord, ultimately is just rubbish. It, it doesn't really matter. Uh, what matters is knowing Jesus. And having you live in our hearts and you be number absolute, no, nothing held back, you be absolutely number one in every one of our lives. And we give ourselves completely to you, nothing held back. Nothing held back. That's a challenge for all of us to do today, is to give our lives to Jesus, nothing held back, nothing. Not one thing in your life. Not any possession, not any attitude any action, any anything, nothing held back. It's all about Jesus. 
And we just commit ourselves to you completely and reaffirm that again today, O oh God. And Lord, I just pray the concert tomorrow night would be wonderful. We're not coming just to be entertained. We're coming to worship with this legacy quartet. As they sing, we want to worship. And yeah, there's some entertainment involved in that. I'm not going to deny that. But it's not all about just us coming to uh, and being entertained. We want to come and worship you with them. And I just pray tomorrow night would be a wonderful evening in our church, oh God. Thank you that we can host this group. Uh, it's a privilege to be able to do that. Lord, we just want to give everything to you. We give the rest of this service to you. Speak to us, Lord, all of us. You speak. Lord, I need you to do that through me. It's not about what I have to say. What I have to say really isn't that important. But it's what you have to say that really matters. So help us to hear your voice. We pray, oh God. We thank you. We bless you. We lift up and exalt your name today. In Jesus' name. And everyone said? Amen. Take a minute. Greet someone around you. You got about uh, 45 seconds. Good. I wish, I wish he'd let me know. I'm the last one to know anything. That's a little frustrating. But she's out of surgery. She just got out of surgery. Doug, turn the lights back on. Yeah, more more lights. It's too dark in here. That's fine. That's fine. Well, we t usually turn the two outside lights on and have the middle lights off. I know, that's what I had. No, you had, you didn't. Go ahead, whatever. Okay, so let's come back together. So how do you know the resurrection happened? How do you know? We take by faith, don't we? Amen. Can I prove without a shadow of a doubt that Jesus actually rose from the dead? Can I prove that beyond a shadow of a doubt in a physical way to somebody? No, I cannot. Oh, I gotta stop and I gotta tell you something. Dell just got a text message from Leonard. Marcia Brumley just got out of surgery and is doing fine. The Lord answers prayer before we even pray him, doesn't he? He kind of has a way, doesn't he, of doing that. He kind of does. We take things by faith, amen? And we need to live by faith. There was this guy that lived from 1675 to 1751 named Jean-Pierre Cousad. And he once said, to live by faith is to live joyfully, to live with assurance, untroubled by doubts, and with complete confidence in all we have to do and suffer at each moment by the will of God. Sounds like a good statement, doesn't it? Anybody have any problem with that? I do. I'm going to say it again. To live by faith is to live joyfully, to live with assurance, untroubled by doubts, and with complete confidence in all we have to do and suffer 
at each moment by the will of God. Now you tell me that you're in here and you never have one doubt about anything. I ain't buying it. Sorry. Don't mean to offend anybody. I mean, does anybody here besides the pastor ever have any doubts? I don't doubt Jesus' existence, but there's things I do doubt. Do I have the kind of faith that this guy, Jean-Pierre Coussard, talking about? Well, I try to, but do I always line up perfectly with that? Yes, I do, perfectly. I'm, I'm just perfect. No, that's not true. It's not. It's a challenge, though, to do that, isn't it? To live by faith is a challenge. All the atheists are out there saying, prove it, prove it, prove it, prove it, prove it. Well, I cannot prove in a scientific, tangible way. But Jesus has made himself known to me, and I'm sure he has to you as well. But I can't prove it in a scientific kind of way. We live by faith. Amen? That's what we live by. We live by faith. What's one of the most well-known passages in the Bible that deals with, deals with this? Well, you already have the cheat notes, so you already know. Hebrews 11. So we're going to go to Hebrews 11. I'm not going to read the whole chapter. It's too long. And take too much time. I'm not going to read the whole chapter, but I'm going to read various verses from it. Hebrews 11. Now, starting at the beginning, now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. Skip down to verse 6. And without faith, it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. By faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear built an ark to save his family. By his faith, he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place that he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. He just went anyway. He didn't even know where he was going. That's a step of faith. He didn't know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. By faith, Abraham, even though he was past age and Sarah herself was barren, was enabled to become a father because he considered him faithful who had made the promise. In other words, he trusted God. He trusted God. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. By faith, Abraham, even though he was past... Okay, I just read that. Okay, Brian, get up to speed here. And so from this one man, he... And he, as good as dead, became descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things they promised. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. And they admitted that they were aliens and strangers on earth People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had an opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Jump down to verse 32. And what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, 
whose weakness was turned to strength and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. Others, we don't like this part. Others were tortured and refused to be released so that they might gain a better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging, while others, still others, were chained and put in prison. They were stoned, sawed in two, put to death by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains and in caves and in holes in the ground. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. God had planned something better for us so that only together with us would they be made perfect. People of faith step out even when it doesn't make sense. Faith must affect our actions, folks, not just our thinking. Faith is one of those things that's easy to talk about, but it's not always easy to put into action. Is that true? Amen? I'd say amen to that. It's easy to talk about, but it's not always easy to put into action. You know, um, take this altar here. I could step back and look at that altar and say, by faith, I could jump up and down on that thing and it wouldn't break. But you don't know that until I do it. You're going to have to take it by faith because I'm not going to jump up and down on the altar. I'm just not going to do that with an altar. I'm just not going to do that. Faith isn't wistful longing, folks. It is the utter conviction that results in action. True faith is trusting God, not our senses. The great biblical commentator William Barclay said, Christian hope is belief in the spirit against the senses. The senses may grasp for the moment, but the spirit tells us, that there is something far beyond that. That's what God says. There's something far beyond what your senses can tell you. Atheists live by their senses and, their, and, and what they can see and what they can prove. That's not how we live, amen? It's not how we live. It's not how we live. We, you, that's why we can't please God without faith. We don't know him by our senses. We can see you know, we can't see him, or, or I, I can't literally see him with my eyes, but I know he's there because he's made himself known to me. We know he exists by faith. He sometimes works through our senses, but our trust in him goes far beyond what we can see and hear and smell and touch. Faith is the acceptance of a fact which already exists, but what has not been manifested to your senses yet. Ladies and gentlemen, someday you will see Jesus face to face. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see when I take him by the hand he leads me to the promised land. Remember the song? No, I'm not going to keep singing I've tortured you long enough. No. Someday you're going to see him face to face. When you die. And he's going to say to you, come on in, good and faithful servant. Here's your reward. You will see it then. But you're not going to see it now. Do, do, have, has anybody seen heaven here? Well, there's people that have written books that say they've gone there. Okay, I'm not going to argue with them. You know, I, I, maybe they did. But I have to take what they say by faith. Can they literally prove it to me? No, they can't. We, we have to take it by faith. People of faith 
build as God leads despite what others might think. We've got to be ready for negative responses from doubters, folks. Let's go back. Go back to... Um, some verse. Verse 7. Now, we all know the story of Noah and the ark. We know it upside down, backwards, and forwards. But folks, stop and think about what Noah did. Everybody thought he was a lunatic. Can you imagine being out in a desert and building a huge boat? Everybody thought he was crazy. Can you imagine if we lived in the desert of eastern Oregon? Let's say we lived in Burns. Okay, let's not say we live in Burns. I don't, I don't want to live in Burns. Okay, let's say you live between Bend and Burns. And God says to you, there's going to be a flood. And I want you to build this huge boat. And I'm going to bring all the animals two by two to get into it. Everybody would think you're crazy. That's what Noah put up with. Everybody thought he was a nut job. How would you like to th- have everybody in town? How would you like to have everybody in Florence think you're totally crazy and you're, you're a total lunatic? Now we can say, oh, well, you know, Noah was a great man of faith. Well, easy for us to say now. We didn't have to do it. Imagine Noah having to do that. Easy for us to look back on now. It would have been really tough, folks for him to do it. Really, really tough. We got to press on with courage even when we're nervous. One pastor said, I thought this was really good. I don't, I don't remember his name. Courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is going ahead and doing what you're called to do in spite of your fear. I mean, folks, you think you're ever going to not have fear about doing what God calls you to do? Think again. We're going to have fear. And we're going to have some doubts. We do it anyway. We press on anyway. God may call you to some new venture, some new ministry, some new level of trust. If you're a little bit nervous, well, welcome to the human race. But do it anyway. Do it anyway. Faith presses on anyway. You guys remember Bill Russell? Played for the Boston Celtics. You remember Bill Russell? Even I know some of you aren't thinking, I am not a basketball fan. I don't care about basketball. Bill Russell was probably one of the most famous players in the NBA in, in history. He was really tall, and he was really good. He was one of the best to ever play the game. He dominated the court in so many ways over years and years and years. One time a sports reporter asked him, this all-pro basketball store, if he ever got nervous. Now you'd think, Bill Russell, what was he, like 6'11"? Anybody remember? He was really tall. Thank you. You you actually know that? You sat across from Bill Russell at a golf course? I want to touch you. Okay, I really don't want to touch you that bad. I mean, Bill Russell was one of the best players to ever play the game. This sports reporter asked him if he ever got nervous. His answer was surprising. He said in his his blunt honesty, before every game, I go and throw up. That's what he said. He goes, I go and vomit before every game. Bill Russell, seriously? One of the best players to ever play the game? And he's so nervous, he goes and throws up before every game. 
the, the sportscaster asked him, well, what if you have two games in the same day? He said, I throw up twice. <laughs> That's just gross. If Bill Russell can get nervous about playing basketball, it's okay for you to be a little bit nervous when God calls you to do something you haven't done before, but do it anyway. Do it anyway. Some of you may never have come to a single mom's oil change. Come anyway. I need a bunch of ladies to sit in that foyer and just chit-chat and make small talk with some of these single moms so they know that we're a friendly church. You say, I, 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 I'm not really good at that. Come anyway. We'll put a cup of coffee in your hand and a cup of coffee in their hand. When there's a cup of coffee in each hand, boy, the conversation flows a lot easier. We may even give you a cookie. Maybe. People of faith look beyond immediate circumstances, folks. Folks, people of faith got to look way down the road, not at what's just right in front of you. You just, you just can't do that. You may never get to see the completed picture. These guys didn't. They didn't. It says they didn't. They didn't, they didn't, get, it, they didn't get to see. Um, they were commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. You may never get to see it either. But you know what? We go on anyway. Verse 13 says, All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised, but they only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. But they were still great people of faith. Even though they didn't get to see the fulfillment of the answer in their lifetime. You know what, we live, you know what, you know what today is like, folks? And you know this as well as I do. We live in a day today where everybody wants any, everything instantly. I want it instant now, 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 now. Right? Is that what everybody wants today? We go to the drive through window at McDonald's, and if, they, if we have to wait very long, we're impatient. Get me up there and get me my food. Get me my cot fudge sundae that I don't really need anyway. You know, but we live in a, we want it now and we want it fast. That's why fast food is so popular. We want everything and we want it right now. Well, guess what? Christians don't get everything right now. You may not even get it in your lifetime. And in fact, a lot of things you probably will not. God helps people of patience, of people of faith, to have patience. you got to be patient, folks. You may say, why in the world am I going through this? I can't give you a good answer for that. We live in a sinful, broken, fallen world. These people, what, what do they put up with? Stoned, sawed in two, put to death by the sword, went around in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. What did they do? They kept on being people of faith anyway. Even though life was really rotten for them in many ways. That's not fun, folks. That, that, that's, not, that's not fun. Do I like it? No. To be honest with you, you really don't. Do I like to be, see people in my church suffer? No. Don't like that at all. Is it going to happen? Yes. It's going to happen. I've seen a lot of people die over the years. Sometimes it's not pleasant. But you know what? That's called life, folks. 
People go through some really lousy stuff before they die. I don't want to get too personal here, but I watched my dad go through six years of Alzheimer's. And it was awful, folks. And I'm thinking, my dad is a man of God. Why does he have to go through this? Why not? People prayed for him all the time. Did he get better? No. We live in a fallen, broken world, and people are going to die tragic deaths of cancer and Alzheimer's and pneumonia and all kinds of stuff. Is it fun? No, it's not fun. We hate it. But it's part of living on this fallen, broken, sinful world we live in, folks. We don't all get to live to be 110 and then just magically just one night just go up to heaven. Sorry, it doesn't work that way. It didn't work that way for these people in Hebrews 11. If it didn't for them, why should we think it's going to for us? We think we're that much better than they were? Ah, uh, no. No. But when you look past living for the moment, God will honor you. God will honor you. Look at, look at verse 15 for a, a second. Let me find it here. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Abraham takes off, doesn't even know where he's going. Doesn't even know what the end result is going to be. But what is he? He's obedient anyway. He's a man of faith. He trusted God. Living by faith means swimming hard against the tide of our culture of instant gratification. Our culture is a culture that wants instant gratification. We're not going to get it. Every time you go to the doctor, he's not going to be able to cure you just like that. Sorry. Doctors aren't God. And God never said we wouldn't suffer in this world. These people did. Why do we think we're any better than they are? Why do we think we shouldn't have to suffer? If these people suffer, went around in goatskins and sheepskins, were destitute, sawed in two, alive. That's pretty ugly to think about. Have you ever been through anything like that? No, neither have I. I hope I don't ever have to go through anything like that. But you know what? We would for Jesus. We have to be willing to make the sacrifices to see our faith realized. You will pay a price to be a man or woman of faith that God has called you to be. You're, you're going to pay a price for that. Just be prepared for it. Everybody that goes to heaven pays a price. Everybody that goes to heaven pays a price. You take the step of faith and you trust God even when other people around you are saying, you're a jerk. You're a fool. No, I'm not. I trust God. And I'm going to live by faith, whether it makes any sense to you or not. Noah sacrificed all his friends and what they thought of him. Adam sacrificed his, Abraham, sorry, Abraham sacrificed being with his family, left a lot of his family, and just took off where he didn't even know where. Moses sacrificed all the pleasures of being the grandson of Pharaoh, Noah, Moses could have lived in absolute luxury for the rest of his life and maybe eventually been the ruler of Egypt, but he gave it all up. He said, it's not worth it. I don't care about all this stuff. I don't care about all the money and all the fame and the glory and all that stuff. I don't care about all that stuff. Moses gave it all up. Joshua risked everything when he led the Israelites into the promised land. Many of God's spokesmen or women, the prophets, gave up their lives living for their faith. Take Jesus' disciples. They were all, excuse me, they were all killed except John. Every one of them was executed. 
And they were going to crucify Peter, and he said, no, you're not going to crucify me the way you crucified Jesus. You're going to crucify me upside down. I'm not worthy to die the way Jesus died. Oh, he say, oh, well, yeah, John got away with it. He wasn't, he, wasn't, he wasn't executed. No, he was just sent out on this island and exiled there to live the rest of his life all by himself on virtually nothing. He was set out by himself. He had nothing. He had absolutely, he lived in a cave. But God gave him a revelation that we know as the book of Revelation. No great thing comes without faith and being ready to sacrifice, folks. Let me tell you the story before we close. There's a guy named Eric Fellman that speaks of meeting a Chinese couple in Hong Kong while traveling in China. A friend, he said, uh, he said, a friend took me down a narrow alley to a second floor, second floor flat to meet a man recently re- released from prison in China. I knew I would be asked to carry Bibles and literature on my trip, but I was hesitant and tried to mask my fear with rationalizations about legalities and other concerns. A Chinese man in his 60s opened the door. His smile was radiant, but his back was bent almost double. He was all bent over like that. He looked at us, he he led us to a sparsely furnished room. He doesn't have any money. A Chinese woman about the same age came into service tea. As she lingered, I couldn't help but notice how they touched and lovingly looked at each other. My staring apparently didn't go unnoticed, for soon they were giggling. Was it, what, it, what is it, I asked my friend. Oh, nothing, he said with a smile. They just want you to know it's okay. They're newlyweds. I learned that they had been engaged in 1949. This story is just a few years old. They were engaged in 1949 when he was a student at Nanking Seminary. On the day of their wedding rehearsal, Chinese communists seized the seminary. They took the students to a, they took all the students of the seminary to a hard labor prison and for the next 30 years, the bride-to-be was allowed to visit him once a year. Each time following their brief minutes together, the man would be called to the warden's office. You may go home with your bride, he said, if you will renounce Christianity. Year after year, the man gave him a one-word reply. No. No. I was stunned. How he had been able to stand the strain for so long, being denied his family, his marriage, and even his health. When I asked, he seemed astonished at my question. He replied, with all that Jesus has done for me, how could I betray him? The next day I requested my suitcase be crammed with Bibles and training literature for Chinese Christians. I determined not to lie about the materials, yet lost not one minute of sleep worrying about the consequences. And as God had planned, my suitcases were never inspected. This guy went for 30 years in a hard labor prison to where his back He walked around like this. That's how he walked around. He'd have to look up like that. Can you imagine how hard that'd be? And his fiance gets to visit him once a year. It's a crazy microphone. You can go home and be your husband if you renounce Jesus. No. Every year, For 30 years, he said no. He gave up his wife for Jesus. Folks, that's sacrifice. That's sacrifice. Let me close with this thought. 
People of faith aren't required to have perfect faith, folks. People of faith are not required to have perfect faith. Faith isn't, faith isn't the absence of doubt. Faith is going ahead despite doubt. Faith is going ahead despite your doubts. Eric Fellman didn't have perfect faith, but God used him. In Mark 9, we have the story of the father who had the son who was demon-possessed. The disciples hadn't been able to help the boy. Jesus comes and asks the father about his son. The father replies in verse 22, It has often thrown him into the fire and water to kill him, but if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us if you can. If you can, said Jesus. Everything is possible for him who believes. Immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. He didn't have perfect faith. He admitted it. I do believe, but help me with my unbelief. And the guy saw a miracle. Matthew records this story, and afterwards, the disciples asked Jesus why they couldn't heal the boy. Jesus, Jesus replies in, in Matthew 17, 20, because you had so little faith. I tell you the truth, if you have faith the size of as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. Folks, you ask God for mustard-sized feet, faith, and you can see mountains moved. Now, can I go up into to the hills around Mapleton and say, mountain, move to the ocean. Is it going to be moved? No, it will not. <laughs> We're not talking about lit moving literal mountains. How about the mountains of problems in your life? Are they all automatically going to go away if you're a person of faith? No. Will God help you overcome them? Yes. Yes. If you have faith, you can overcome the problems and the difficulties and the challenges of your life. So let me close with this. Are you a person of faith today? And if you would say yes, how does anybody know? If you say, yeah, I'm a person of faith, does anybody know? We got to live it, folks, not just talk about it. We got to live out our faith, not just talk about it. Sometimes, and you think, well, you're a pastor. Sometimes my faith seems like the size of a mustard seed. But mustard seed faith can move mountains, folks. God is calling us to be people of faith today. How's your faith? That's what I'm going to close with. That's the challenging question for this morning. How is your faith? Will you stand with me, please? We've got to be people of faith, and we've got to live it. I don't know what that means for you. It's probably going to mean something different to every person in this room. But we've got to live out our faith. And that means putting up with problems. For me, I don't know about for you, but I'll tell you what the challenge is for me. The challenge for me is putting up with problems and not complaining. It's so easy to complain about everything. But nobody wants to hear it. I don't think Noah complained. I doubt Abraham did. And all these other guys that put up with a whole lot more problems than we'll ever put up with. I mean, we're not being persecuted the way they were. We're not destitute the way they were. I don't know that they complained. For me, I don't know what the challenge is for you, but for me the challenge is to just take it and, and shut up and stop complaining. Because you're going to have challenges in this life. And we pray that, they, that you overcome them, and, and we pray that you beat the challenges. But not all the challenges are ever going to go away. They're just not. Because it's a broken, fallen world that we live in. 
But we need to live out being people of faith. Let's pray. Father, help us to be people of faith. Lord, we can't do it on our own. At least, I, I don't know about anybody else here, but I know I can't. I, I just can't do it without you. But you give us faith. And we want to be people of faith, and we are people of faith. These are people of faith. I know they are. It's not that they haven't shown any faith. They're people of faith now. But Lord, would you show us how you want us to put our faith into action? We need to put it into action, and we may get some flack for doing it. Help us to do it anyway, for your sake, not the sake of our popularity or anything like that. Oh God, would you help us today? Help everyone in this room, everyone that is listening to my voice on a computer at home or wherever, help us to be people of faith. And to not complain about the challenges and the problems of our lives. Because they're going to come and we have to deal with them. Help us, oh God, to be people of great faith. You, only you, can empower us to do that. And we thank you that you will. And Lord, we will put it into action in any way that you lead us to do. We will do it. And you get all the praise and all the glory because you're giving us the umption to do it. And we thank you for that today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. And amen. Go and be a person of faith today. Trust that when you go out to dinner, your credit card will pass through the machine without getting rejected. Be a person of faith.